introduce the kind of work that has been done in our lab. Um, we are exploring ways to augment um, our physical environment with digital information, and uh, which happens to be on a normal desktop like this. And knowing this is a fairly novel approach to human-computer interaction, and that our mental models have um, not been quite established yet, um, my contribution to this project is to provide a um, theoretical framework for guiding these interactions. Alright, so today we, um, we live in a world where technology continues to evolve and um, diverge at a very rapid pace to um, meet the needs of um, various users. And from desktop PCs to laptops and from laptops to um, other um, computers, Computers came in much smaller form factors and became more mobile to meet, um, to sort of satisfy our information consumption habits. And among these computers, um, tablet PCs and ebook readers have been um, one of the trending tech products that um, um, these days, which are gradually becoming more lightweight um, and thinner and cheaper. And as a result, um, many of these products tend to simulate the paperwork experience um, as much as possible and combine that experience with the forces of digital technology. And so you'll be able to see the nice um, animated pa um, page flips as you're reading through your, um, one of your favorite um, books. And also, you'll be, even, um, you'll be able to write notes on it with a stylus, just like we do with our um, regular pen and paper. Um, however, even with the added benefits of digital technology, um, a large portion of office and knowledge workers tend to rely on the physical papers and pen um, to do their work. So I ask myself, um, what is wrong with technology? Or why do we keep on going back to paper? And if so, what is so good about paper? Well, um, first of all, paper, um, it's light, it's flexible. Um, it runs on no power, so um, it makes it disposable. And unlike touch screens and um, your, one of your iPads, um, it provides enough friction to, um, for us to leave pencil marks and pen marks. And this also made me think, um, what are we good at as humans? And experimental psychology teaches us that our hands are great predictors of um, our activity. Um, so, for example, um, our grip postures um, differ very, um, depending on the nature of that activity. And for heavy duty activities like hammering a nail, um, we tend to use a power grip. Um, but on the other hand, um, for more delicate activities like writing or drawing, um, we tend to use a, a grip posture called a precision grip. And the same principle applies to um, bimanual interactions, where um, you'll notice when you write, um, your non-dominant hand um, mainly holds a paper um, which you're writing on, and to control the position and orientation at any given time. So understanding how our body works um, has true merit when it comes to informing human-computer interaction. And, um, because then we can think about how the technology can fit human and adapt to our needs instead of the other way around. So the real question to ask is, um, given the benefits of using paper and the things that our hands are capable of, um, how do we make technology fit humans um, and adapt to our needs? And to be more specific, um, when, where, and 
and how should technology pervade our experience of the world? Um, and so these are the questions I ask and aim to answer through my research. So my approach to this problem is to look at one of the most common activities we tend to engage ourselves in, which is active reading. And active reading consists of um, reading, which of course is the main activity, and it's fluid interactions with the various <coughs> secondary tasks um, that tend to support reading, and which includes annotation. So you'll uh, find yourselves writing notes on the margins or writing a post-it note, or underlining and highlighting. And um, you'll also um, be looking for um, particular words, so, um, and also browse through contents. And file organization and cross-referencing between multiple source documents. And all of these tasks require a very high level of interconnectivity, um, resulting in a high demand for cognitive resources. And so um, active reading becomes a great test bed to um, really um, explore the various forms of interactions um, that arise from the complexity and the richness of this activity. And how we make technology fit this um, experience of active reading is to look for those signature, um, signature cues that underlie each interaction and that may help us uh, that may help us or the technology identify them. All right, so in order to find those characteristic cues, I looked at a collection of videos um, which were provided by one of our collaborators um, in Germany. Um, that shows a top-down view of the desktop workspace. And the readers in, the, um, in these videos are um, graduate-level students um, who often engage themselves in research-related reading activities. So I have analyzed these videos using our very own Chronobiz, which is a tool to aid in the visualization and um, annotation and the analysis of the multimodal sets of time-coded information, uh, which is why we have a video and audio waveform. And through my analysis, I captured every interaction, or uh, every instance of interaction, um, using a coding scheme to represent um, reading, annotating, and other manual activities, which are represented by the white and black and uh, um, the color that is supposed to represent And so I categorize all my findings under these activities and paying specific attention to the characteristic cues that um, help to identify them. And an, an example of a multimodal cue would be something like the orientation of my head um, when I'm talking to a friend sitting next to me. And cues like this can provide enough information for the computer to learn um, the context of a certain activity, such as the location of um, the friend that I'm just talking to. And so in the next coming slides, I'll be talking about um, these activities in more detail and maybe give you um, some concrete examples of how these cues can inform um, human computer interaction. So as I mentioned earlier, reading um, is a deeply solitary and immersive activity, which requires an intense level of concentration, and that also makes it vulnerable to interruptions. And, but however, we often um, skim to speed up the reading process, and we typically skim with a pen or a pencil or a finger on a linear fashion in um, in order not to lose track of the lines of text that we're reading. And a signature cue of this activity is the relaxed grip um, posture, which is very different from how we um, grab our pens when writing. And so first, um, as you can see on the video, um, the angle at which the pen makes uh, with the surface is very low and almost reaching a 45 degree angle. And also, you'll notice that the tip of the pen is extended long enough um, to be visible at any orientation. And I believe that uh, we tend to make these um, grip postures in order to avoid occluding the area of text that they're 
that we are reading. Um, and also to overhaul, um, enhance the visibility of the text. So an example of how technology can support this kind of um, reading strategy is to cast a highlight around the area of text um, where the pen meets. And also, um, this will make the text stand out relative to the um, rest of the text. Representative of a transient um, attention of our or transient visual attention, it tends to fade away as we move down um, lines of text. And skimming is often accompanied by a place marking gesture, which is performed with the index finger of our non dominant hand. And Unlike skimming, um, which moves along the written text and within the text area, a typical marking gesture marks the margins um, adjacent to um, the text that we're reading, um, either moving up or down relative, um, again, to the uh, text that we're reading. And this gesture also seems to guide our visual attention. And so my implementation here is to use a pinch to zoom gesture to select the area um, of the text that I want to highlight. And annotation. So we tend to express our thought process um, by writing notes. And similar to reading, um, writing comes from a deep thinking, and it is an activity that should not be um, disturbed as well. And so these are the two activities that I think technology should not um, actually pervade. And to add more, other forms of annotation such as um, underlining, highlighting, or circling are already supported by um, the benefits of paper. Next, I'll be talking about cross-references. So we tend to glance back and forth between um, papers to compare the, uh, their contents and make quick comparisons and make quick judgments about the topic um, that we are interested in. And we often achieve this by holding the paper that um, we want to refer back to or if we are stapled, we might, we might lift and tuck in the finger, um, tuck in the finger between the pages that we plan to return and read. So um, my, my implementation of this design queue is to project an overlay of the paper that is um, tucked between the fingers when the reader glances back and forth um, at the other page. Um, so this way the reader can make quick um, comparisons without putting in too much effort. And once we finish reading, we tend to um, organize our documents into files. And before files are formed, um, they are always preceded by a chopping motion um, in order to align the on a group of papers in either direction. And another interesting fact about um, creating files is that they generate a unique sound pattern, um, which are shown as the peaks in this audio waveform. And these acoustic pulses, um, pulse patterns, were reliably good for predicting um, any sort of howling activities, uh, such that they, they actually promise an alternative channel to interacting with um, computers. And my implementation of this multimodal queue was to simply project some text to notify um, the reader that the system has registered the file. And 
you'll see why this is necessary um, in, the next few, in the next few slides. of the piling activity, um, for which papers are stacked on top of <coughs> each other, um, searching for a particular paper becomes a very serial and time-consuming process. And as you can see here, a typical search activity starts from the top of the pile by removing one paper at a time. already knows um, which paper belongs to which pile, we can easily um, initiate a voice activated search to um, look for that specific pile or um, which contains a paper you wanted to read. <coughs> Um, which is when, where, and how technology should um, pervade the academic experience. So the when and where is easy to answer. Um, since these multimodal cues will serve as a precursor to any given activity. But um, it's important to choose which activities um, we need to support. Um, because we don't want to replace existing practices that we are already familiar with or we are good at. And probably don't want to be interrupted. Um, so these include a task such as reading and writing. And the how part, um, this is a little bit difficult, but while computer vision and visual feedback um, remains to be the dominant medium for interacting with computers, um, <clears throat> I've shown that there is a promising way to communicate with computers through other um, input channels or modalities such as the acoustic um, pulse patterns. And so um, this concludes my presentation. That uh, you know, I thought it was probably best to kind of leave that alone, given that you know paper has the affordances that are really necessary. To, you know, take our notes, highlight stuff. Uh, one of the things I really like about like tablet computers and like reading on that is that you know if you take a note in the margin of something you're reading, uh, and you decide you change your mind on what you think about that note, you can erase it, or you can highlight something and then maybe decide you don't want it highlighted. So I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on kind of how you might be able to implement some kind of system like that, where it's, you still have the, the paper in front of you, but that, you know, when you're doing your annotations, you can go back on your annotations and change them right. later. So, um, there is a technology already available to do that, and we can um, easily use um, digital pens and paper um, to sort of um, um, simulate that process by um, writing on top of a um, dot, an, um, an anodal pattern um, paper on top of, you know, um, right underneath the glass. Okay. And um, with the technical setup of um, using a projector and um, some kind of um, depth sensing um, camera, um, you can easily you know, mark um, some kind of um, highlights or underlines and easily um, erase them. Um, my idea was to support more of these natural 